December. And we are here to open another window in the Two Fat Lardies Oddcast Advent Calendar. Today, we're asking young Nicholas what's his favourite wargaming army. Sleigh bells ring, are you listening? In the lane, snow is glistening. A beautiful sight, it's the Lardy Advent Christmas calendar in sight. And here I am with another day of um, revelation, I guess is the word that we will be using. So what's the question that the chaps have got for me today? Let me have a look. Uh, Nick's favourite army. Okay, my favourite army is a really difficult question to answer. Um, I'm sure like many gamers, as I head into, head into my uh, 50s, I have um, got a slight problem. And the problem I've got is that I have so many armies and so many figures and toys that actually I don't know where to store them all. And this is really causing me a problem because I'm thinking that I might have to get rid of some stuff. So I've been looking at what I have got with a view to clearing up some space and, and getting rid of some things. And I can't bring myself to do it. I've got so many things um, uh, from so many periods in so many scales. The big gap, as I think I may have mentioned on another day in the Advent calendar, is ACW. I don't really have any ACW. Um, and I don't really have that much medieval, but the rest of my collection is spread across the years uh, and some of them of course are very old and dear and have sentimental value because I've had them for a long time uh, and others have value because they get used a lot or because um, the figures look fantastic or because they um, open up a campaign or a new era that you've never played before so choosing a favorite one of those is really difficult one of the things I have to confess to here is that having gamed for many, many years with Richard, that does place a fundamental challenge in front of you. And the challenge is this. When Richard gets his heart set on a, on a period, he goes at it and he creates an army in the blink of an eye. Before you've even finished discussing a project on the telephone, he's already got figures on the way to him through the post. He's already got, within a week, some stuff on the table. And within a month of that, he's probably got a significant force assembled. Now, if you're a pedestrian uh, when it comes to painting or when it comes to selecting your armies, that leaves you with a real problem because, hey, your mate is collecting all these wonderful figures. And you can suddenly think, well, hey, what, what am I going to do? What, which bit of this do I get? What do I do to, to um, contribute to this in a way that doesn't duplicate what we've got as a, as a unit to play with? And what that creates is, in fact, you start to create units around the edges. You start to get those units that, that are not mainstream. You start to focus on those little interesting uh, battalions or forces or, or components of different armies that, that don't form part of the main battle line but are appealing because maybe there are some nice little models or there's some nice standalone units. And of course the other factor there is you potentially don't have to paint thousands of them, you know, you only have to paint a few. So a great example of that will be my Napoleonic Nassau, for instance. I'm a big fan of Nassau, I've got some lovely Nassau figures, the 28mm from Front Rank uh, and from Perry's. Uh, and I actually mix Front Rank and Perry's together, which a lot of people don't. Um, but I think you can get away with it if you're basing and creating your units in, in a way that just it just makes it feel a bit more real, I think. Some of them are ridiculous. Some of them you put one next to the other and you think that doesn't work. But actually, for a unit, I often find you can get away with it. Um, so my Napoleon and Nassau are a really good case in point. They're one of my favourite armies uh, because they are contained. I think they look great. They look different. And, you know, they just they just have their certain space on the battlefield and they have their certain reputation and, and the history that goes with them. And, of course, one of the enjoyments is researching the individual history of these units as well because uh, they're slightly different to the mainstream. They've got a bit more going on. They can be a bit more interesting than some of the bland, what you might call bland, um, big main line uh, units, I guess. So my Napoleon Nassau's would certainly be up there in one of my favourite lists. Um, I think the other thing would be then, okay, well, if, you, if, you, if you're going to do bits of units, um, then maybe you need to focus on a war, for instance, that perhaps nobody else is interested in. And I've got a bit of a track record in the past of going towards things that nobody potentially produces lots of figures for and consequently becoming very frustrated when I'm trying to create a force that doesn't yet exist. 
Uh, and I guess the best example that I can think of is this would be the First World War in Palestine armies that I started to put together in, probably in the early 2000s in 15mm. I knew that I wanted to do brigade level games in Palestine in the First World War and there wasn't really any figures available for that. Minifigs did a few at that stage and um, Eureka did a few at that stage and again you've got two figure manufacturers there that have you know, it says 15 millimeter on the box but what you get are two very very different size figures um, but I was able to build up an army of First World War in Palestine and it still remains one of my favorite armies and it's because it is so different it's because it's got you know it's not just again a case of, of creating infantry there's interesting units around the side you've got the Imperial Camel Corps for instance uh, you know you've got guys mounted on camels going into action mounted on camels and then deploying and acting almost like a regular cavalry uh, and fighting on foot in that way you've got um, uh, the the Australian Light Horse of course very very famously in the Palestine campaign Australian Light Horse performing um, you know great acts of, of um, military prowess I guess through the Jordan Valley and some really good actions around cavalry in that period but so that I think that will be one of my also one of my favorite armies which would be the first world war in Palestine the Turks are interesting the combination of of, of machine guns and um, you know dispersed infantry tactics across the open ground plus of course I have a family history uh, interesting connection to that which means that the, the reading was really interesting and fascinating and I think if you can find a period in history that really fascinates you and really interests you then building the army that goes with that is a really nice project that, that drives your reading and is also inspired by your reading and therefore you read more and you create more figures you buy more it's a spiral isn't it the interest in the history drives drives the drives the creation of the army and the creation of the army you want to grow the army you find out more about it and the more you read and I think that's at the heart I guess of, of what our hobby is about so I've got Napoleon at Nassau, yes, there's some of my favorite. I love my 28mm gangster figures. We did some gangster figures. Uh, we were using Dixons and Copplestone, combining them with old dinky toys, and I've got figures riding on the, um, what do you call them, the sort of side plates of these vans. They look really, really good. They're not really an army, but they're one of my favorites, and often when I'm reorganizing my shelves, as I have been lately, my eye will fall on them, and I think... Yeah, they don't really contribute much, do they? But I just can't bring myself to get rid of them because they're so lovely. And I, and I do enjoy, every time I go past them, taking the lid off the box and just you know, opening up and, and, and say, well, these were good fun to paint, but I'll be buggered if I know what I'm going to do with them now. And then I put them to one side, but I can't bring myself to get rid of them. So I'm, you know, struggling here, aren't I? Napoleonic Naval, love it. One twelve hundredths Rog Langtons beautiful ships completely different to land-based army you know ship by ship there and the real labor of love to create but actually once you've got them and you see the fleet that you've created wonderful toys I am going to go with a favorite though uh, predictably at the moment I'm going to go with British Recce for the Second World War I love the variety of that unit again it's a unit that's um, you know, outside the mainstream, if you like, but you've got reconnaissance units, you've got the small Daimler Dingo armored cars, you've got the Daimler armored car based on the you know, same sort of chassis but with the turrets. You've got within the same unit, you've potentially got the um, the larger Matadors in there too, and then later in the war, the Stag Hounds you've got. So you get a great variety of. of, of, of what you would call armoured fighting vehicles, I call them even tanks, but I would get completely told off for saying that, but I look at them as part of my tank collection, they're all there, and I love the fact that you create a unit that's got that variety, and you've got to, you know, you've got the recce troop, as it would have got into action in July 1944, or the end of July as it's trying to cross, um, you know, push out of Normandy, or or again in September when they're pushing up in, in, into into Holland. I love the fact you can create those, and with a bit of stowage, of course, you can make them really, really interesting. They are 
probably my favourite models in my collection. And I'm hugely indebted to uh, Paul Edwards, who has who has the 3D technology to create the toys that I've been seeking for so long in um, the scale that I want to use them in, in 150th stroke 148th. That's what I like my armoured vehicles to be in for the Second World War. And Paul and his magic 3D printer is like Father Christmas. He is the man who comes down my chimney and leaves something nice and sweet under my tree and he's done it again very recently with some late war British tanks but British wreck is really really good for me really important and of course within that the British uh, airborne reconnaissance squadron that formed part of first airborne division that goes into Ireland famously Freddie Goff and his reconnaissance jeeps in 28 millimeter they are fantastic with one section you're know, using two jeeps um, so you've got, I don't know how many Jeeps I've got in total, 15 or 18 Jeeps. They look fantastic. Whether you can ever deploy them all into one game, of course, who really cares? The truth is that the desire, that the fun in this comes from, from, getting the, from getting the toys assembled, putting them together, um, seeing them there and just, and just thinking, wow, they look fantastic and I can't wait to get them on the table. Um, so I think for me, my favourite army on reflection at Christmas would be my Second World War British reconnaissance units. Remember, lard is for life and not just for Christmas.